All right, everybody. Um, welcome everyone to this YouTube live stream on uh, control system design in Simulink. Um, I am Sid. I'm an I'm electrical marketing. engineer. Oh, um, yes, yeah, I can go ahead. Continue, <laughs> Sid. Yes, OK, so uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. Currently, I'm working as a product manager here at the MathWorks, looking at some of our controls toolboxes that ship with MATLAB and Simulink. And Arkady? Yeah, same. Um, here to talk about um, our control design capabilities and tools with you and uh, answer any questions that you might have. All right, thanks for joining in, Arkady. So um, if you have any questions during the live stream itself, please feel free to use the YouTube chat and uh, we'll answer those questions as we go along. Um, so yeah, so since this is our first live stream regarding control design uh, in Simulink, um, I'll just give you a quick overview of what we are intending to do in this uh, live stream. So what we did was we took a couple of uh, most common questions uh, which Simulink users have um, designing controllers in Simulink. Right? So some of the most common challenges that they face and tuning different types of controllers. And so we'll kind of answer those questions on how to tune such controllers by using some of the capabilities uh, that Simulink has. Right. So particularly, um, we'll first uh, talk about PID controllers, um, since this is uh, one of the majorly used controllers out there in the industry. Uh, we wanted to talk about how you can systematically tune these PID controllers to meet uh, your design specifications. Um, and following that, uh, we'll do a quick time check, see how we're doing, and then we can kind of go into maybe looking at how you can tune controllers for multivariable systems. That is, again, one of the common questions. And then finally, to wrap things up, uh, we'll kind of dive into the world of adaptive controllers. Um, these are controllers which you can use, um, and those controllers can adapt itself to changes that your plant or process has um, in its operation. So those are some things which we'll be seeing. Yeah, we might not have time to go through all the examples that we have, so um, you you can indicate in comments which of these are most interesting to you, so we can prioritize time accordingly. Yep. So before we start, um, I just wanted to mention, you know, for those of you who are new to MathWorks or um, we're not familiar that much with the products. So we offer two platform products. One is the MATLAB, which is the graphical programming, um, not, not the graphical program, it's a programming interface. And then the other one is Simulink, uh, where it's more of a block diagram environment where, where you use blocks to kind of design your model. So for this live stream, um, we are concentrating on control system design in Simulink. Uh, one of many reasons because um, this Simulink platform is quite popular with our users uh, who are doing control design. Uh, one, because the block diagrammatic way of uh, modeling your system is quite easy to understand. And Simulink provides other capabilities like simulation. So you can kind of build your models across different domains using these blocks and um, add in your continuous time or discrete time controllers, simulate it, verify performance in simulation. And then once you're done with verifying in simulation, uh, Simulink has capabilities to kind of move into the deployment world where you can deploy your controllers to an embedded system. And these embedded systems could be running C code or HTL code. Um, so there is a good bridge between your simulation and your deployment phase. And also, there are a lot of uh, verification and validation tools for the entire process. So we kind of look into Simulink modeling um, in this um, live stream. So particularly, um, we'll be looking at some of the capabilities of this add-on product called Simulink Control Design, which has been um, particularly designed to uh, design and analyze control systems in Simulink. So this product lets you do a variety of things, um, such as linearize your nonlinear Simulink models that you have, and then do some linear analysis, and then use these linear models and do controller design, like PID controllers or you know your classic control design like pore plots, root locus, and also uh, working with uh, multivariable systems, tuning like multiple input, multiple output controllers as well. So 
we will see uh, uh, quite a few of these uh, capabilities here. But if you're interested in looking more into this product, just Google Simulink Control Design and uh, view what is available in Simulink. Right. Anything uh, in the chat, Arkady, before we dive in? I think we, we can keep going for now. OK, so let's uh, directly dive into Simulink now and look at PID tuning, how to do that. So let me bring up a model, which I have here. OK. So uh, I have a model of uh, engine speed control for a typical automobile. Um, so we have the plant model here, which is in the sh shaded region. It's a nonlinear plant model of uh, internal combustion engine. And uh, by nonlinear, let me give you an example. Go into this throttle body uh, subsystem. And uh, you can see a lot of these nonlinear equations that define the operation of this uh, subsystem. So there are many other subsystems like this within this model. Uh, so this makes this system quite a nonlinear model. And uh, the input to this nonlinear system um, to the engine here is the throttle angle, which is U. And based on the throttle angle, your output would be the change in the, not the change, but the speed of the engine in uh, revolutions per minute. Right. So that is the input and output for the system. And uh, say you want to design a controller, uh, specifically here, a PI controller, um, such that it can bring about good reference tracking in the speed reference profile that you want. And say you want to like tune these gains to give some or meet some design specifications. And for the sake of this example, let's say we want some time domain uh, specifications that need to be satisfied. So for a step input, say we need a settling time of under five seconds and zero steady state error. So these are two requirements that we have. Now, typically, um, if uh, you're doing this design Simulink, some of you might be doing some ad hoc approach of tuning this uh, controller, tweaking the gains and simulating it and trying to figure out which of these gains give you satisfactory performance. But as you might agree, this is a long process and it's not very optimal uh, in giving you the best performance uh, for the controller itself. So let's kind of look at a way on uh, how you can automatically tune these uh, PI gains or PID gains for your uh, Simulink model. Right? So before we kind of see that, I want to just talk a little bit more about this PID block, uh, which is available in Simulink. Um, so this lets you characterize your uh, PID controllers. So you can choose from different types of controllers, say like a PI or a PID controller. You can choose the form and also whether it's discrete time or continuous time. So right now we're just keeping it in the continuous time domain. And down here is some of the some of the other characteristics which you can provide the controller itself. So you can provide in the gains of the PI controller here. And uh, say you want to limit the output uh, for the PI controller, you can provide it in the output saturation tab. And there are also these other tabs which you can use, um, which I'm not going to cover here. So let's say we have these arbitrary gains, uh, one and one, which we provide this PI controller right here. And let's kind of see how the performance is right now with these arbitrary gains. So I'm going to run this system. And let's look at the scope. OK, so this right here is the scope of the engine speed. Um, the reference uh, in the speed change here is the blue line. So you can see we need a step change of around uh, three from 2000 RPM to 3000 RPM. So that's the step. And this yellow line here is the actual measured engine speed. Right? So um, looking at this step response right away, we see that it's not uh, good at all. So at steady state, you see a lot of oscillations here in the engine speed. And uh, also there's a bit of overshoot here in the initial part of the step response. And also we could improve the settling time as well. Right. So with this kind of like an initial uh, performance, how do you go about 
fine tuning uh, tuning your controller to get better performance that meets the gains uh, it meets the design specifications so for that i will go back into the pi controller um, block dialog and here under automated tuning i'm going to click on tune so what it is going to do is it's going to bring up this app called the PID Tuner app. And um, what the app does is it's going to linearize this nonlinear model that you have here uh, at time equals zero. So it gets out a state space representation of your uh, nonlinear model. Uh, so, the, so you linearize it, you get that state space representation, and it uses that state space representation to automatically tune your P and I gains. So if you can see here, the plant uh, variable here is the linearized model, the state space model that you see here, the ABC matrices. And uh, down here on the lower right, um, you can see the tuned proportional and integral gains that the PID controller came up with. And uh, here is the resultant step response of the system. So, uh, here you can see the step change is just one. So what it is showing is just uh, the step response uh, for a step input from 2000 RPM to 2001 RPM. Um, and we can look at a couple of other things. One thing which I wanted to show you was you can look at the time domain and frequency domain characteristics um, of the system. So you can see that for the current PI gain configuration, after tuning, you have this particular rise time, settling time, and overshoot. And you also have these uh, stability margins, the gain and phase margins, as you see here. Right, so just looking at this, um, the settling time, we wanted it to be less than five seconds, which is under the limit, which is good. Um, so apart from that, I think um, this right now, this step response looks good. So what I would do now is try to verify how the gains perform in the nonlinear model. So to do that, I'll click on update block. Chit, as you're doing that, let me uh, clarify for everybody yes. what happened. So mm -hmm. you started with a Simulink model. That model you had nonlinear engine dynamics model, right? You you knew the equations, so you implemented them with the gain blocks, the function blocks, and so on. In the initial the controllers that you had there didn't provide stable response with all the oscillations. So you click that button, that magic button, that linearize the model around the initial operating point of the system and automatically computed the gains, right? For you, okay. And you didn't have to do anything else. And that's mm -hmm. the response of the system was a linear state space for that state space model that, that you showed us that we're seeing in this app. And so now you're going to take those gains, push them back into the Simulink model and see how the nonlinear simulation performs. Yes? Yep, that's exactly okay. it. So I pushed those gains now into the system and the nonlinear system here. You can see here the gains have changed from one and one. Let's kind of go and run the simulation again and kind of verify how these gains perform for a step change from like 2000 to 3000 RPM. So we see a very similar response and there is a huge amount of improvement from what we saw before with those arbitrary gains. And so we don't have an overshoot, settles quickly um, below five seconds and it has a steady state error which is zero, which is good um, for this particular um, scenario. So in case, um, you know, you might have a question, you know, how do I further fine tune the gains if you need it, you know, to kind of meet a specific uh, time domain or frequency domain characteristics. So how do you kind of go and do that? Um, and for that, the, the PID Tuner app provides you an option to do it. So let me jump back into the PID Tuner app and uh, I want to bring your attention to, to these sliders here on the top uh, where you can kind of ch change how your response time is and the transient behavior is so let me kind of bring in yeah. what is transient behavior 
So it tells uh, how aggressively your initiant, uh, the initial rise of your step response will be. So for example, if I want the transient behavior to be aggressive, if I move the slider here, you'll see it has a pretty sharp overshoot and it's like pretty aggressive. And also you see the rise time decrease. Right? So if, if I bring it to more robust, it has a smoother rise. As you can see here, uh, the rise time um, increases. So you have a smoother rise, but then your other characteristics also change. So you got to like play with these sliders to get to a state where you're happy with the time and frequency domain characteristics that you have. And so when you move the slider values, the algorithm recomputes the new set of gains, and that's the step response that we see. Yep. OK. So this is you know, time domain. If you are the person who is working with frequency domain, you can choose frequency domain, and you have your more familiar bandwidth and trace margins. Now you can tweak this to you know, increase your bandwidth for a faster response, and uh, you know, change the face margin as well if you want to change the overshoot and all of that. So oh, that's okay. how you would so go that, about that transient response is really a face margin. That yeah. makes more sense to me. Um, OK, I understand that better. So bandwidth and the face margin. All right. All right. So yeah, I think that's a quick way to use this PID tuner app and tune your gains of your nonlinear symlink model. Let um, me ask you a question that we are we're getting in, in the chat. Um, the question is, OK, so what you're showing here Tuning, tuning these gains, that works just for a linear system, right? We're doing this tuning for a linear system. Mm -hmm. But you know, what about a nonlinear system? So the initial systems that we're working with here is, is nonlinear. So how are we tuning the gains for a nonlinear system? How are you controlling the nonlinear system? So what well, that's one thing which we do, like you know, we linearize the nonlinear system initially, right, to get a in your presentation and use that to tune the gains. But then once you do that, you get those gains. One thing to validate your performance would be to kind of move over to Simulink and kind of run simulations with those gains and figure out how your uh, time response changes. If it's uh, not uh, as close to what you saw for the linear system, then you would need to tweak these sliders to get to a point where you're satisfied uh, with the response for your nonlinear system. Um, Arkin, yeah. if you wanted to share something else, add on to it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, the tool that we're showing now, it's working. <clears throat> it's taking a linear system like the state space model um, that Sita is showing, and the gains are computed based on this linear system. Um, so when we're working with a nonlinear simulink model, um, like a lot of you know classical control design techniques, we have to pick an operating point, linearize a nonlinear model around that operating point, and then design in this case, PID controller for um, the linear dynamics around that operating point. And the question is, how nonlinear is our system, right? I mean, if it's not too nonlinear, maybe we can get away with one PID controller. If the system has strong nonlinearity that is changing the dynamics from, you know, maybe 2,000 RPM to 3,000 RPM quite a bit, then um, the set of PI gains that we're getting here for 2,000 RPM is not going to work well for 3,000 RPM. So in that case, we would use well, one approach potentially that's called gain scheduling, where basically we would linearize the nonlinear system at different operating points, 2,000 RPM, maybe uh, two and a half, 3,000. We'll need to decide how nonlinear our dynamics is. Design a PID controller for each uh, operating condition and then schedule the gains of the PID controller with, with the operating condition, in this case, maybe the engine speed. All this is supported, and we have examples that are showing how to do that. In fact, in this PID block seat that you mm -hmm. had in your Simulink model, maybe it was difficult to notice, but one of the options in that block, if you maybe can go back and open the block dialog, is uh, the source dialog, right? And so right now it's set to internal. So what the source dropbox means is where the gain values are coming. So the gain values can be specified in the block itself, like we are doing here, or they could be, if you select the external uh, for a second there, 
you know, that would add the additional imports to the block, as you see here. So we get the uh, imports for providing the proportional gain and integral gain. And so um, if you're designing a gain schedule controller, then you'll have basically lookup table that's implementing what this P and I gains and, you know, in general case, D gain would be as a function um, of, um, of, your, um, of your speed or some other scheduling variable. Thanks, Arkady. Yep. That was a good point about gains. Let's, let's take a couple of mm -hmm. other questions. Sure. Um, there is a question somebody joined late. So um, what what are we talking about today? Very briefly, recap for people. All right. Yes. So we're just uh, talking about some of the capabilities for control system design that is available in Simulink. So uh, what we're doing is taking some of the common questions that Simulink users have been asking us on how to tune certain controllers, and we're showing some capabilities on how to do that uh, in Simulink with some examples. OK, good. Um, question from the audience. Um, people are wondering if PID controllers are still used commonly in the industry because you know you can design other controllers, optimal controllers, robust controllers, maybe, you know, adaptive controllers. Uh, what would you say? Definitely. I think in my experience, yes, definitely. There are a lot of other new and upcoming controllers that are being used. But if you just see by the sheer volume, you know, if PID controllers are simple uh, to understand and it's easy to implement. So there is still a lot of interest, uh, I would say, for these controllers. So that's why we were covering this. Actually, if you have any additional points that you want to. I mean, one one of the uh, topics that hopefully we'll get to is um, the newer type of controllers that we are supporting designed for the mobile reference adaptive controllers. But yes, I think uh, PI and PID controllers are still very, very commonly used in, uh, <laughs> in, in all the different industries that we're dealing with. Okay, okay another question. Um, how long the session will be running, we'll see. I think we can go up to an hour, depending on how many questions you guys have. And um, maybe last question before we move on, what's the difference between continuous and discrete time PID controller? I think people are seeing in the blog the option for continuous and discrete time. So continuous time is, uh, you know, it's, it's you don't have a sample time as in like the discrete time. So discrete time is like it uh, you kind of like have sample time where the PID gains kind of the PID controller works at certain time samples as you provide, uh, and the continuous time would be like throughout time. You know it's not it's not using these sample data points um, that come in at particular samples. So usually in 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 practice you would mostly. Uh, you would require this discrete time controller to work uh, on your hardware. So because you're sampling uh, your inputs or the or measurements from the plant at some sample times, and that is going into your PID controller. And the PID controller, a specific sample time, sends out your inputs to the plant. Right? So, yeah, so so that, that's right. So I think, yeah, technically, you know, how you're implementing the integration, whether it's done with um, continuous Laplace transform, continuous time domain, right? Or discrete, you know, Z variable. But practically any controllers that you would want to implement on um, a microcontroller, software firmware, right? That would have to be discrete time controllers. So you'll need to think about the sample rate and tune the controller for the discrete time. And, and the block supports that. So if you choose discrete time, specifies the sampling time and goes through the tuning, then uh, the tuning will happen in, in uh, discrete time um, uh, domain. Um, if you have an analog controller, right, that would be similar to what the continuous time PID controller is implementing. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, so I think it's 11.25. Maybe I'll quickly show uh, another way of uh, tuning uh, PID controllers. Um, you know, this is a common question again. So, you know, for this particular example, we had a nice nonlinear model uh, that we had already developed within Simulink, and then we tuned your uh, PID controllers for it. Now, there might be cases where you might not have modeled the system in Simulink. Um, so in that case, um, you might be asking, OK, I don't have a model in Simulink, so how do I go about uh, tuning PID controllers? And I don't want to spend time kind of looking um, to develop each and every component of my system. So how do I go about doing it? 
so there is a way about uh, how to go about doing this. So one way is, um, you know, more than likely you will have the prototype or the physical system that uh, you want to design the controller for in your office. Um, so what you could do is you can get some input output data from the system, right? So you excite the system that you have with some input signal, like a step input, record what the output from the system is, and then you can import this IO data um, into MATLAB and Simonic. And uh, using system identification toolbox, which is another add-on product, you can um, fit a linear model, um, like a first order transfer function, second order transfer function, or a state space model, and then use that linear model which you identified and tune the PID controllers for it. So I'll quickly run through a simple example to show you how to do that. Let me close this and uh, up MATLAB here. So I already have data which I got from a simple DC micro motor. So this is the input output data. So the graph here which you see in the bottom is the uh, step input. Um, so this is a DC micro motor from which I got this uh, data from. These are used in these dental drills and polishing equipment. So what I did was I just uh, excited the motor with some voltages. So um, you can see here I kind of uh, uh, stepped up the voltage from 1.56 volts to around 2.28 volts and you can see the RPM increase from 23,000 RPM to 35,000 RPM. So this is a um, looks like a first order response uh, for this uh, motor. So I have this data within um, MATLAB. So how do I go about identifying a linear model from this input output data? So for that, I'll open up another session of uh, the PID tuner app, which we just saw. So first thing which we need to do is import this input output data uh, inside this app. So I'll go to the plant dropdown and click on identify new plant. And under the get input output data, I'm going to import that step response. So this should open up a dialog here. And uh, I already know the uh, signal characteristics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to populate this quickly. So the output is the RPM data, which you see here. The uh, input step response here kind of asks you the characteristics of this step input. So the amplitude, I know 0.72 volts. And the offset here um, is 1.56. And the onset lag is, uh, 0 0.01 seconds, and I sampled this data at uh, 0 0.1 milliseconds. I'm going to add all of those in. I'm going to import um, this step response. So yeah, so you can see the I/O data in the PID tuner app now. So this is the step input, this is the output, and what the app is trying to do, uh, this blue line here. So it's trying to fit a first order model as you see here in the plant structure. So it's trying to fit this first order model onto the output data. Right? So right now it's not doing a good job because there's this offset here in the output data and you know, linear models don't kind of reflect that offset very well. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of pre-process the data to remove this offset and you know, that would probably help in fitting this uh, first order transfer function onto that uh, data. So I'll go to pre-process, remove offset. So this would let me remove the offset from the signal. I'll choose the output and click on the signal initial value. So this would remove that initial offset that you have in the identification data. Right, so I'm happy with this. Right. Now let's see how the PID tuner fits that data. So for a yeah, for the first order transfer function, this is a pretty good fit. Uh, but yeah, usually from the physics of a motor, we can say um, we want to fit like an underdamped pair um, that typically models a motor. 
uh, and then see how that fits. OK, so we have a fit like this. And um, what we could do is we could manually kind of tweak this, uh, change the poles and um, the kind of the coefficients of that underdamp pair uh, transfer function to kind of get it to fit. Or you could hit the auto estimate button, which would uh, try to auto fit a uh, second order model onto this uh, identification data. So if you can see here, it runs a little bit of uh, an optimization process and it kind of fits a data here with uh, a good um, fit here, 87% to the identification data. So that's, that's a pretty good fit, I would say, for this um, identification data. And um, I'm happy with this. I'm clicking on apply and this would give me the identified plant model. So you can see here um, the second order transfer function, uh, which we fit around to the data along with the coefficients that you see here. You see, let me stop you here and just recap what you're doing because yep. you've been going for a while. I wonder if people are keeping track. So there was actually a question about different ways to model plant dynamics. Um, and so, um, there are multiple options that we offer in our tools, right? So I think this with this engine examples that you showed in the beginning, that's one way um, when you know sort of the equations that are describing the dynamics. And you can implement those equations using blocks like, you know, product, um, mass, um, like sine or cosine, you know, uh, addition of signals um, and so on. There are other options that we have is uh, we, we are calling it physical modeling, our tool for that, a simscape. So that's when you can describe differential equations that are describing dynamics of the system without explicitly writing them out, but just uh, drawing, you know, the circuit schematics of the system. So you can, if it's an electrical system, can uh, basically draw an electrical circuit with resistance and doctor um, or pump you know, the IGBTs and so on, right? If it's a mechanical system, you can draw different bodies and the joints, different joints that are connecting them. Finally, the options that you're showing here is when you only have the input and output data and you're trying to identify the dynamics of the system from the data, right? And so what you're showing here is identifying linear dynamics, so state space model or process model or trans function from input output data, because for control design, for PID tuning, we only need a linear model, but there's a toolbox, system identification toolbox that is used to identify system dynamics. You can also identify nonlinear models if you want to stick them into the simulation of your system and simulate how that works. So what you showed us here is loading the step response that we measured from hardware into this tool, then specifying the structure of the linear models that we want to fit first order, or as you said, in case of a motor, maybe a second order. We can do an arbitrary state space model with a higher order as well. Um, then we can graphically adjust the parameters, maybe pole locations or delay um, in the system to improve the fit, or we can the optimization based tuning of parameters. Um, you know, work its wonders and, and come up with the best fit. And once we get the good correspondence between the measured data and um, the uh, models that we're feeding, we can use that model to tune PID controller gains. How would we know that the model that we're feeding does a good job? I mean, if we have a particular test data, we can always, you know, for that particular test data, do a really good job with feeding a model. How do we know that this model generalizes that you know it would describe well a different data sets that we measure from hardware? Yes, so that's a good question. So um, an option would be to have multiple data, data sets, right? So you excite your system with multiple, say, step inputs. And uh, you know, with the identified plant model that you see here, um, you can actually export this plant model into MATLAB or Simulink and actually have this uh, linearized model be run with those different uh, inputs and look at the outputs and kind of figure out if your outputs kind of match with what you see on the physical system. So that's how you would go about validating if the model which you identified is a good enough uh, model that represents 
um, across different operating points or different inputs, so on and so forth. Yeah, so you, you need additional additional data from hardware and then you would try this model on the different data sets that you didn't use for feeding the model. Yep. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so I think um, what are some other options? Uh, sorry, questions. Uh, people are asking, shouldn't we be um, uh, linearizing the model at an, at an equilibrium point? Do you want to comment on that? I think that was when you talked about how the PID tuner uh, linearizes the model at the initial, at time zero. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, what about linearizing the model at a steady state equilibrium point? What are the capabilities for computing the equilibrium steady state points? So is the question about how do you kind of linearize it? Um, so if I know that this would be an equilibrium point. How do you kind of put that in the PID tuner? Uh, I think the question it. is, if you want to linearize a model at a steady state equilibrium point, how would you do it? What are the capabilities that, that we are offering in similar control design yep. for so, trimming a model? Yes, so uh, we have uh, another app, you can say like the model linearizer app, uh, which has uh, a wide variety of options that you can use to trim your model at different operating points. So you can throw it in like states, so like the timestamps, uh, at once, uh, at, at times where you want to like linearize the model, and then you could you would get a bunch of uh, different linear models for different timestamps or operating points. Um, so you can search that in the documentation of our software model linearizer. I think actually it'd be also good. I'll, to I'll share a link. link. Yes. Yeah. So so with that tool, um, you can you can decide when you want to linearize at what condition you want to. Um, um, or initialize a model. So one option is you can just run the simulation, and you know, if you have a stable controller to begin with, the system will come to a steady state maybe after initial transient. So you can say, okay, linearize my model at a snapshot, simulation snapshot of five seconds. That's one option. Another option you can say, I want to find an equilibrium steady state point, as, as people commented. So you can say, okay, I want to, um, find an equilibrium steady state condition where the engine RPM is 3000, right? What's the value of the throttle that will give me the steady state value and what are the values of other states so that the system will have uh, no initial transient if you start from there. And so uh, the small linearizer app lets you do that. It lets you access all the states in your Simulink model. Say, okay, for the states, I want a fixed value. For well, other states, I don't care what the value is. I just want them to be in steady state and go find me a combination of inputs and outputs to the Simulink model so that the model would be in a steady state equilibrium at that condition. And then once the tool finds that, you can use that equilibrium steady state point to initialize your Simulink model so that when you do the, uh, when you start the simulation, there is no, there is no transient. The model is in steady state. I All right, so. very okay. good. Let's keep going. Yeah, so yeah, in the interest of time, okay, so what I did was uh, I quickly kind of finish this up. So what we have currently is like an identified model that you see here, right? So once you're uh, happy that, you know, you're validated your model with other data sets, you're happy that this would be a model that um, does very well uh, to reflect the actual system. What you could do is go over to the PID tuner tab here and uh, Kind of choose what kind of a PID or PI controller you want to tune for that system. So in this case, let me choose a PID controller that I want to tune for uh, this linear model. And the PID tuner automatically tunes uh, the, the controller here and with the gains that you see in the lower right corner. And so again, use the show parameters tab here to kind of look at the different time and frequency domain characteristics. You kind of play around with these sliders uh, till you get a required or desired response. And then after you've done that, you can export it. So this is the part where um, you can export both the controller that you designed and also the plant that you identified into MATLAB. So I'll show you um, here the workspace. 
So you have these two variables C and plant one, and uh, these are the controller and the plant uh, variables which you have here. And then you you know you can use this for further analysis or your controller development either in Simulink or do some analysis in MATLAB as well. And so we have examples. Uh, we'll share links on uh, how you could do this. But in the interest of time, I think it'll be wise to move on to that last topic. So any other maybe, questions? Uh, yeah, one one question maybe is that we can answer. Yeah. If you go back to the PID tuner app, do you still have it open? Yes, I do. Okay, so I think there is a question about basically uh, looking at the results and frequency domain, because we've been showing the we've been showing the stop tracking, and the question is, you know, can I look at the body plot for a system with a given controller? Absolutely. So, okay, think you can maybe it's, show it's that under the design um, ribbon here, um, you have the step different step response plots for time domain, and here down here is the frequency domain plots, which you can choose for different configurations, open loop or uh, closed loop, and you know the different like input disturbance ejection or output disturbance ejection. So depending on what and is... Can you select one of these options, yeah. like maybe open loop? OK, all right, so that's so our body plot. plot. And this we, should, the... we should also say that this is just one of the apps. All this functionality is available uh, through the command line, so if you um, don't like using the apps and just want you know repeatable script that you can just run and share with colleagues all of that is uh, supported so for example for the you know for for plotting the body uh for trans functions there is just a command that's called body in matlab um, that you can use that that would give you the support okay thanks it all right cool so that was pid tuning now uh, i wanted talk about those one of those newer more advanced controllers so i want to specifically talk about um sorry. um let me pull up right slides okay yeah so bringing the topic now towards adaptive controllers so these are controllers that you can use when you're process or plant dynamics change um, as the system is operating. So um, adaptive controllers can be a good fit here. And to kind of um, bring about an example that can explain the use case of an adaptive controller, um, I have a scenario here from an aerospace example, uh, particularly for an aircraft undergoing wing rock. So this is a phenomenon. So for those, those of you who are not familiar with what wing rock phenomenon is, it happens in an aircraft uh, coming in for a landing, right? So these aircrafts are coming at a very slow speed and high angles of attack. And it could happen that one of the wings stall, and this stall wing can, can actually uh, result in a roll motion towards the stall wing. Right? So this would cause the aircraft to tilt uh, in the stall wing side. And what that would do is it would recover that wing from the stall, but then that would cause the other wing to stall. So that would cause an open, uh, opposite roll motion. Right? So in the end, it goes back and forth, and you see some kind of like a um, oscillation in the roll of the aircraft. And uh, this makes the aircraft pretty hard to control for the pilot when he's coming in for landing. So say the objective for this particular scenario is uh, we need to cancel these undesired roll oscillations, which are like nonlinear disturbances that are acting on the aircraft, and also bring about um, stable reference tracking um, for any of the commands that the pilot gives in the roll of the aircraft, right? So you can imagine and this is quite a complicated problem. And let's say we just look at the most simplified dynamics of the aircraft here in the roll, right? So these are the system dynamics. And uh, there are two variables which you're interested in, theta and p. So theta being the roll angle and uh, p being the roll rate. Right? So here, um, I would like to mention that this f of x, which is acting on or affecting the roll rate, is the nonlinear disturbance, so the wing rock dynamics, which is acting on it. And um, I would like to, uh, for this example, another um, thing which I would like to mention is this L matrix is the control effective matrix and the 
uh, delta here is the aileron input, so the control input to the aircraft. So for our case, uh, this L is unknown in uh, the magnitude. We only know it in sign. So there are these hurdles here, right? So f of x is this nonlinear disturbance in the, the wing rock dynamics, uh, which we don't know of, like how to model it. And this L control effector matrix is only known in sign. So now you have the situation, right? So you have a system for which you want to design a controller, but then you have uh, parts of the system dynamics which you're not sure of, like this L matrix. And also you have these external um, disturbances, f of x, acting on the uh, aircraft itself that you don't know how to model. So in this case, is how do you kind of uh, work out a controller that can give you good performance? So as you can imagine, simpler controllers like PID controllers won't work in this case. And so um, this would be a right time to kind of introduce one of those adaptive controllers that can help. And uh, this is the model reference adaptive controller. Um, so before we kind of jump in uh, into simulating and go crazy on the model and how to set things up, I want to kind of showcase uh, the conceptual view of how this controller works so that you have an idea when we kind of move into Simulink. So I have this, I have set up this uh, animation or like a diagram to kind of explain this. Right, so look at, uh, look at this uh, concept from a general control design perspective. So we have like a nominal system, uh, in this case, the system of the, the aircraft system, right? So which you model using your state equations. And say you want to like design a controller for it. You know you have inputs to the plant, and you get the outputs from the plant itself. And then you can design um, like a feedback gain, a feedforward gain. You know, come up with a typical closed loop control system like this, right? And you can tune these feedback feedforward gains so that you get the desired characteristics that you want. Say rise time, settling time, or some kind of like a gain and phase margin requirement. So you can um, come up with that. But where model reference adaptive control is different is instead of specifying these different characteristics for your closed loop system, you can say that, you know, I have this open loop reference model or a reference system which um, you have, which you model with some equations, and you really like the dynamics of that reference model, and you want this closed loop system here to really mimic or match the behavior of this reference model. And so you just give this controller the reference model. Hey, I want my closed loop system to behave like this open loop system here. So that's the differentiator here in this model reference adaptive control. Um, so what happens now is when I say match the behavior, I essentially mean match the system states, right? So X, and the measured states from the reference model should match over time. So what we're going to do is kind of like compare the states as we go on and kind of uh, check, make changes to these feedback and feed forward gain so that over time as it goes, the error becomes zero, the error between the states. Right? So this is one part of that model reference adaptive control where you provide a reference model and your closed loop uh, system tries to match the behavior of that reference model. Now, this would work um, in an ideal situation where you know your um, dynamics of the system properly. So you can kind of design this feedback, feed forward gains to match the reference model behavior. But that is not the case here. As we saw that there were disturbances acting on the aircraft itself, the wing rock. And also there was uncertainty in the nominal system model itself. Right? So in kind of presence of these uncertainties, there's no way that you're going to tweak these feedback and feed forward gains to match the behavior of this reference model. So that's where you know, the adaptive control piece comes in here. So what the adaptive control term does is it takes a look at this error signal over time, and it designs or models the disturbance which is acting on the nominal system, right? So once it kind of estimates the disturbance, it's gonna add into this control input or the feedback and cancel out the disturbance. So that you have a nice baseline system that can be 
um, that can use these feedback and feed forward gains to match the behavior with the reference model. And so th those are the two pieces here uh, which make the model reference adaptive control work. And so that's a quick little introduction on how it works. Not going too heavy into the math since there are a lot of math involved in the back end. Um, so if there are no questions, I think I can skip to the um, MATLAB and Simulink model to set this up. Yes, I think you should. <clears throat> we are <laughs> running close on time. Close time, yeah, we have about 10 minutes. I think it should be sufficient time here. Yep. OK, so I have this live script here. I think the text is proper, right? Okay. Are you able to read? Yes, you yeah, can, okay. can read it fine. Okay, so I have this live script that sets up the uh, nominal model, the reference model, and also the model reference adaptive control parameters. So here you have the dynamics of the aircraft in role, right? theta dot and p dot. And this delta x, which you see here, is the wing rock dynamics, um, the nonlinear wing rock dynamics, which is dependent on the states. Now, this model reference adaptive controller, which we are about to design does not know this equation. So it is completely oblivious to this equation. So it has to estimate this disturbance in real time and cancel this out. So that's what we're going to see. And um, here we have um, provided the reference model that we want the closed loop system to match the behavior of. So this is like a second order model with some desired dynamics. And XM here is the uh, reference model state vectors. And so here um, we are initializing variables to define the nominal system from the state from the dynamics of the aircraft. And this is AM and BM are the matrices for the reference model. So we add in some initial states for the nominal and reference model. So that is the definition here for the plants. And down here, we are going to like design or set up the parameters for the model reference adaptive control. So first one is the feedback and feed forward gains. So these gains are calculated because we know what the nominal model is, at least the approximate model of the system, and also the uh, reference model. And so by knowing this, you will be able to kind of design these gains. So that sets up that. And here, finally, uh, we come to the part of uh, kind of modeling this adaptive controller piece, which I talked about, that would model the disturbance and the uncertainty in the plant and help cancel it out. Right? So let's see how the this model reference adaptive controller does that. So this adaptive controller term, um, which you see here, is being modeled by this term here, W transpose phi of x. And so phi is kind of like a feature vector which you can specify. And this could be anything. It could be like states of the system or any kind of custom feature vectors. Um, and W is the uh, weight matrix uh, for each of those individual features, right? So I'll kind of uh, go over this example um, with one such example of a fee. Um, what I'm going to use here is uh, something called the radial basis function. And to simply put what it is, it's a universal function approximator. So this would go well in approximating the nonlinear uh, disturbance and the uncertainties itself. So I'll give you a quick animation of how that works. OK, um, what I have. Here is a picture of those radial basis functions. So you, the, the, uh, the radial basis functions here are like just Gaussian radial basis functions. So just a bunch of uh, Gaussian functions which are centered or evenly spaced between two points. So that is phi in this case, and the weights W you see here. And say that this f of x line is a nonlinearity or a nonlinear disturbance that is acting on the plant. And we want this um, W transpose phi uh, to approximate or kind of estimate this. 
So what happens is, um, let's say, let this thing come up. Yes, so W transpose fee is this. And as um, the system runs, these weights here are optimized so that this product kind of approximates this nonlinear uh, disturbance and the uncertainties. And so this allows the uncertainty to be canceled out um, by the controller to bring about that model matching condition. So that is a quick idea of how that term works. Now just to go and show some results in Simulink. Let me open up. Simulink model here, which I set up. Okay, so just to give you a quick overview, um, this state space model here represents the nominal model of the aircraft, and this uh, MATLAB function is the um, wing rock nonlinear dynamics that is acting on the aircraft itself. So this model reference adaptive control block, which is a block that comes standard with uh, simulating control design, lets you set up the parameters required. Right. So if I look into the block dialog, um, you can set up the nominal model and the reference model, and you can choose uh, the feed forward and the feedback gains here. Um, right now we have just static gains, uh, which is good enough for this example. And here you have um, your disturbance model or the adaptive controller term that we set up here, right? So if I kind of go back to the script here, you know, we actually specify those values for the Gaussians and the learning rates, etc. right? So we have specified them here and that goes into this uh, block dialog. Right? So this uh, model would kind of this this block would take in the reference input from the pilot and the states of the nominal system and come up with control actions that can kind of uh, negate the nonlinear disturbances and also add in the control inputs that bring about that model uh, matching condition with that reference model. So finally, for some results um, in this graph here on the right, if I can. Zoom this in. So on the left here, um, you see the yellow line here represents the nonlinear wing rock dis disturbance acting on the aircraft. And uh, the blue line gives you that estimated disturbance, which the adaptive controller term um, kind of estimates in real time. So it does a good job of estimating this disturbance, and it cancels this disturbance. And when you move on to the right uh, graph here, so the blue line gives you the reference command which the pilot is giving to the stick of the aircraft. And uh, we see the yellow line is a nice second order reference tracking um, which we get from that model matching um, condition which we specified. Okay, so right now it does a good job of eliminating this uh, uncertainty in your process dynamics. So yeah, that's, that's uh, a quick introduction on how to kind of design such adaptive controllers in Simulink. Um, Arkady, any questions so far? Uh, I've been answering questions in the chat. I, I think maybe we should um, recap. Um, I, I don't think there were questions specifically on the adaptive control. So to summarize, I think what, what was shown, right? Um, this, with the time we had, we focused on tuning sort of simple traditional PID controllers that, that a lot of people are still using, but how to do it in a systematic way that, that's fast and you know not ad hoc and doesn't require you to do the tuning on hardware, which is what uh, a lot of people are still doing, as we know. And then, you know, in terms of more modern controllers um, that can deal with changes in plan dynamics, with uh, disturbances, um, showed the mole reference adaptive control block, which is a relatively recent addition to Simon control design, right? 
last year, I think. It came out in 21B, to be exact. Uh, 21B. I, I, th I think the point that I would emphasize, maybe mm -hmm. that's, that's not very clear, is that, you know, it's nice we're showing how to simulate these controllers and simulating um, and, um, you know, design them. Um, one of the biggest reasons for why you might be doing it is because when you need to implement this controller, right, you can you can take this blocks, PID block, uh, with the gains that we tuned, or the small reference adaptive control block, and using our uh, coder products, automatically generate the code that can then go on the target microcontroller that you're using this. So instead of having to write all the C code or, I know, <laughs> God forbid, HDL, which is more, uh, even more difficult to write, right? You you can you can do it all in this high level um, modeling environment where it's easy to understand what's going on, where everything is visual, where you can test your design and simulation before bringing it to the actual hardware. And you know once you build confidence that the design is working um, the way you you intended, you can automatically generate the C code, and there are ways to test this code using different techniques, for example, processor and the loop testing, where the generated code running on the target microcontroller can co-simulate with the plant model running and simulating on your desktop. But once you build confidence in this design and generate code from it, you can put this code on your target um, and implement your controller. Yep. All right, thanks, Akri. And, um... Alec mentioned that, yeah, there, we didn't cover all of what we wanted to do. We didn't cover how to tune controllers for like multivariable systems here. Um, but what we'll do is we'll uh, share some resources that we found uh, will be useful for you uh, to get started on uh, what you saw here today and also on um, multivariable systems. So we'll share some videos, examples that uh, you should find helpful to start with your application. Great. Uh, yep. There's Sounds no good. Questions. So, uh, thanks everyone for attending the live stream. If uh, if people have any last minute questions, we can maybe take one or two. Yeah, we also like to mention that uh, you know if you found this interesting and you wanted to see more of this in the future, if you have suggestions on what you would like to see, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat as well can plan for any future sessions. Yeah. Thanks very much for attending. Hopefully it was useful. Thank you very much.